smiling this morning on this beautiful spring-like weekend. The spring before the storm, apparently. Buy milk and bread today before tomorrow. <laughs> Go to the store. Uh, this morning I want to share um, uh, out of John chapter 4 about the, the Samaritan woman at the well. It's a story we're all familiar with. And... Um, listen to a really amazing teaching. They're just little snippets. You know how you just get nuggets sometimes that just stick with you and stick with you and stick with you. So I thought I'd share this this morning. I'm going to start in John chapter 4, verse 6. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jesus and his disciples were traveling to Samaria. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus in the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, Thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank therefore himself and his children and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall, shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into enter, in, into eternal life. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come thither. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said unto her, Thou hast, said, thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast is not thy husband, in that sayest thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I believe thou, I perceivest thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye neither shall, uh, when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon <clears throat> this came his disciples, and marveled that he talketh with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith, un saith to the men, Come, see a man who told me all the things that, I ev that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the mean, while his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. There's a whole lot going on in that story so much more but the one thing that I had never noticed that never occurred to me that was brought out in a message I heard from Joseph Prince it was Jesus who was invigorated by blessing this woman he was ministered to by her receiving from him and his and the point of his message was that when when man it's better for us to give but when we give we only have so much <coughs> We get weary. We get, our, our resources get expended. But when we receive from God, somehow that just exponentially grows and magnifies the grace and the glory of God. Mom. God is invigorated by blessing us, That's by right. us receiving and taking and receiving and thanking and taking and receiving. And you know what? Suddenly we have something of worth to give. <coughs> and you know what? She didn't need a bucket because now she had a well. Yes. How many of us are dragging our buckets around asking God to fill up a bucket when we are carrying around a well of living water? Yes. Yes. Living water yes. that is the yes. source, that is the yes. source of the seat of the heavens. Mm -hmm. We are one. Yes. We are one. Yes. We are one. We right now on earth right here are one. Yes. Why are we carrying buckets, church? Yes. Oh, I tell you what, I was just taking some inventory 
Lord, show me. Where am I not going to the well? Where am I not just receiving? Where am I asking you to fill a bucket rather than just letting it flow? Receive, and he is magnified. And suddenly we have something of worth. We can't give what we don't have. I can't be sick and pray to heal the lame. I can't, you know, I can't be poor and pray for someone for prosperity. We are one with the source. So I just encourage you, leave our buckets, leave our buckets at the well, and just walk in the fullness of this new life. Fully human. I just love, Nathan, what you said last Sunday. Fully human. I have shared that so many times. Because it's so powerful. Jesus didn't look any different from anybody else. But he was the first, the first of a new race yes, of human beings filled with the spirit of God. Yeah. We don't look any different. We don't talk any different. But there's something very different about yeah. us, church. Yeah. Very different. We carry living water that we can pour out yeah. life yeah. and yeah. light and yeah. salt to this earth. Yeah. To light up the darkness. Light up the darkness, church. I, the Lord keeps saying that over and over. And there is a battle right now. I look at these empty pews, and I don't know what is going on, but there is a battle right now. Yeah. I'm battling myself the battles I don't normally have to battle. But the Lord has declared that this is a season of manifestation. Yeah. Yeah. And I am not going to leave the pool because he is coming to stir the waters. Yeah. And when he comes to stir the waters, I'm going to be at the pool. And I am going to witness, and I'm going to be part of this manifestation of miracles and signs and wonders that we have never seen before. So I encourage you, get to the well. Leave your bucket, and then just follow the Holy Spirit and receive all the blessings he has. In Jesus' name. Expecting to draw from that well. Um, where we are at right now, the Lord um, positioned me in a situation where I don't draw, I'm pouring into. Yeah. That's right. right? Yep. Yeah. There's a vacuum out there, and, I, and many times we think, you know, these guys are awesome, they're on fire for God, and, da, 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 and what you find is parchment. And the oil that the Lord is pouring out in this place, we're not to just keep in our well, but we're to pour out that river of living water I explained isn't actually water, it's actually petroleum based, it's oil That's right. and there's fire on that oil Yes. and we got to pour it out because uh, I, I walked into the situation and, and uh, I thought, you know, I can I can join in with these guys and da 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 and wound up pouring and pouring and pouring mm -hmm. and pouring so as, as I did, I, even one of the gentlemen that was on my left side, he got some of the oil on, he started burning and then doing it great, so I can just let it go from there. So the Lord was only what the Lord was just doing his own forest fire. So um, don't be dismayed by a small group here. This is a very rich well of oil. Yeah. Right? And you're all full of it. <laughs> one, one Samaritan woman. One Samaritan woman changed all of Samaria. That one woman with the living water. She changed all of Samaria. That one woman. Right. How, mu how much more can all of us? Amen. Yeah, she. So, it's cool how the Lord just kind of brings everything, you know, around here. Um, what I, I kind of wrote this out this morning. The pureness and love of the child leads me also at the time. Jayla is uh, just beginning to reach a stage. If you reach out to her, she wants to reach back to you. And it came to my mind of Tracy. When I used to do that to her, she'd always say, Instead of uh, hold your mama, she'd always say, hold your mama, hold your mama. <laughs> and, you know, that's not what she meant, but she meant for me to pick her up and hold her. Yeah. Um, that's what she wanted me to do, right? So it reminds me of our good, good father. Is He has got this song in my head all the time. <laughs> our loving father who dotes on us. You know, he's always there. He's watching over us. He's ready to help us. Like you said, he's delighting in us. And uh, he's waiting for us to say, hold you. Told you, you know? That's what he's waiting really for us to do. Not only that, I was just telling Sally, she doesn't want to crawl. I mean, she's six months, for goodness sakes. I'm ready for her to crawl. She wants me to hold her hands, and she wants to walk, and she walked literally across my room the other day with me holding her hands. I'm like, baby, you're too little to be, to be wanting to walk. But, you know, Jesus wants to hold us every step of the way. He wants to hold our hand yep. when we're struggling, when we're about ready to fall. He's there to pick us up. I got some scriptures. The Lord, your God, is with you in the midst. The mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. Yes. 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 I mean, yes. this seems to be.
here with her the little story about hold you, hold you, hold you. I said, you know, that's what she's just telling you. I told her her name. I said, you know, just, just, just say hold you, Jesus, hold you. And, he, and he's not going to let us down. He's not going to drop us. We're totally safe and secure in his everlasting arms. That's right. Amen. Amen.
Except that in my beloved, that's what that's what I'm hearing in my heart for Ashley. Yes. To know that she is accepted in the beloved and she yes. is beloved and yes. precious. She needs to accept she's got the strength to love and God. Yes. And once that happens, she feels abandoned. Uh, she's left her bond of her of her relationship. She has a daughter that's twelve years old. She's got a I think her son is just really struggling with her job. She's been there for years. She needs a supervisor and she's to the point that she's ready to throw in the towel and, and call it quits there and let the Lord turn into something around for her. She knows it's more than capable of doing. Amen. 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 Yeah. Very frustrated. Amen. 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 Alright, let's go to the Lord this morning. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We trust you, Lord. We trust that you are good and gracious, Father. We trust you, Lord, that the cross of Jesus Christ was more than enough. You are great and gracious, Lord God. Jesus. Jesus. to magnify the name of Jesus, the name above all names, that you be lifted high, Lord. We lay our burdens at your feet and we come to worship you, to lift you up, to exalt the name of Jesus, name above all names. Oh, that we will not be shaken by these situations. We will speak truth and life. There will be light in the darkness. There will be hope in the face of fear. There will be life the face of death, Lord. We don't listen to the doctor's reports. We look to your word. We trust you and your finished work, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Let the lies of the enemy be silenced. Let the Holy Spirit bring to light the scriptures that are our firm foundation, Lord, the scriptures that when we hear bring life and hope and faith, Lord. We trust you, Lord. We believe every word that has been given to us, precious, living, rhema word of God. When spoken, when spoken by your people, Lord, Holy Spirit filled human beings, Lord, power, Lord. resurrection power in those words. Oh, we thank you, Lord, that you hold nothing back, Lord. We don't earn it. We just receive it. That you hold nothing back from us. We thank you, Lord. Lord. Oh, that we pour out all that you pour in, Lord. Let us be greedy in our receiving your blessings. That we may become a blessing. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. As you minister in this house, Lord. 
as we worship you and we praise you, as we lift up your name. Oh, that thank you, Lord, to remind us that you are good and gracious, Father. That you will not withhold any gifts from us, Lord. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Watch over all of those members of this body that can't be with us today, Lord. Let them know that they are missed and bless them wherever they are, Lord, and draw them back to us. Lord, and whoever is out there searching, searching for something more, searching for hope in the darkness, searching for life in the face of death, Lord, bring someone, bring us, bring someone to speak the words of life and hope. Let this house, this house of prayer, be a light in the darkness on the east side of Des Moines. Let, uh, let these people in this body be a light in the darkness all over this city, all over this state, all over this nation, all over this world. Light up the darkness, Lord. The gross darkness is done. The age of darkness is diminishing. Light it up, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We give you all the praise. Thanksgiving and glory in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, have your way today. Have your way in this service this morning, Lord. Your spirit is moving even now, Lord. Have your way in this service, Lord. Speak, Church, if there's a word that you need to speak, this is the place where you speak it. This is a safe place to let the Spirit minister as it wills. Be bold. Give the Spirit voice in this house. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, church, he wants us to know that we are his beloved. We are his beloved son and daughter in whom he is well pleased. He is well pleased. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Also, like he says, we can not hold it, but the word can sustain us. That's why you see that. Anybody that can join us, Friday, February 12th, we'll be uh, doing Eastern Gate House of Prayer, a time of prayer and worship, and just pure focus on the Lord. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Eastern Gate House of Prayer was established by the Lord just six, seven years ago before I was even called here. Um, I don't know if some of you know who Cindy Jacobs is. Um, she does, she's Chuck Pierce's bar. When I was leading uh, worship or working worship with uh, Brian, who's a younger man who I mentored, uh, he mentored at uh, down at the Embassy Suites when Chuck Pierce and Dutch Sheets were here, and the Spirit of the Lord fell upon them, and they were proclaiming Isaiah 22:22, which is the keys of the city, uh, city of David at that time, but for now it was a governmental renewal.
belief in the spirit realm. <clears throat> and a year and a half later, uh, Cindy Jacobs was here with her husband, Mike. And uh, <clears throat> uh, she looked at me square in the face when Cindy and I were leaving. We were talking to Cindy and Mike and, and JC uh, Guzman uh, was standing there with us. And she had a little friend who was moving in the way. Anyway, um, she looked at me square in the face and pointed her finger at my face and said, you have governmental on you. Well, the eastern gate of the city of Jerusalem is all about governmental situation. And the Lord moved me here not only to um, help try to uh, coordinate worship, because um, I heard down in Lucas, Iowa, down at Stephen State Park by myself on a three-day search in God's face, I heard the prayers of the saints here crying out for live worship because they were at that time just doing TV. So he called me here for that. And then second fold was to establish the gate of the city on the eastern side. Um, as I spoke to some people last night, um, revival comes from the north. It always seems like in the Bible it talks about revival coming from the north. And since you guys have a responsibility up here on the north side of Des Moines, we also have a responsibility on the governmental side of the east side of the city. So <coughs> those that are being called into a governmental spirit realm situation to take over what's going on in this region, um, come. Because it's not just about me being called here. It's not just about a handful of us. It's about a body of those that are called into the governmental spirit realm to deal with the things that are holding back the release of the Holy Ghost in this region. Okay? So, join us. Join us. It's usually 7 to 8.30, 7 to 9, depending on how the Lord leads. So. Praise the Lord. Uh, yeah, and there's a rally now. Um, it'll be on the north side in the Ankeny it's, it's up at Heartland Blue Heartland, Eagle, uh, who does the call around the nation. Uh, we'll be here. Um, you'll see, as we're talking about this governmental situation, most of the places in the United States look down on Iowa like an orphan or something. Um, it's not by accident that uh, Franklin Grant came here first. Okay? It's not by accident mm -hmm. that the Iowa caucuses are here first. It's not by accident that Lou is coming here uh, later this coming month. It's not by accident. God's saw up to something, and what they're all seeing is a revelation in the spirit realm of the field of dreams. Okay? Mm -hmm. Iowa's primed. Iowa, Iowa's primed. Um, so we're going to be gathering uh, with uh, Lou and standing in. I know there's others, other reps <coughs> being involved in that with the Azusa Street gathering in California later on this year and stuff. But I see this as an opportunity of Iowa getting aligned and understanding her calling. So. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, let's speak the word this morning. Will may you not, not revive, revive us again, again that, that your people, people may rejoice in you? you. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I am I a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons. I speak in new tongues. I lay hands on the sick and they do recover. Hallelujah. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body function to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. Hallelujah. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. John, you want to come take the offering this morning, please? Lord, we praise you today, God, for you are worthy and we are praised, worthy to be praised. We just want to lift up thy name, worship you, Lord. 
recover in the presence Thanks. of the lovely teacher and the holy name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. for those that are fighting the flu and the sicknesses and stuff also there's a lot of it going around um it just needs to stop yes it just needs to stop hallelujah i see you transferring back from one family member to the other family member and then back to the original family member but get those chains broken right now in the name of jesus hallelujah in the meantime let's worship the lord We will dance, we will dance for your glory. We will dance, we will dance for your glory. We will dance for your glory, Lord. We will lift up a shout to adore you. Every sound that we make it is for you. We will dance for your glory, Lord. For salvation's in this place. You're the name by which we're Shake the sky, lift up and cry, be glorified. The King is coming in. We will dance, we will dance for your glory. We will dance, we will dance for your glory. We will dance for your glory, Lord. We will lift up a shout to adore you. Every sound that we make, it is for you. We will dance for your glory, Lord. For salvation's in this place. You're the name by which we say Jesus Jesus let your name be lifted high as our thankful hearts now cry Jesus Jesus lift up your head to ancient days be lifted high to ancient dogs Shout to shake the sky, lift up the cry, be glorified. The King is coming in. Yes, He's coming in. We're the people of God with a song to sing And we're bringing our lives as an offering We will dance for your glory, Lord As the cross is a hope that we hold on high As we tell the world of your love and life We will dance for your glory, Lord Lift up, here we go So lift up your gates, you ancient gates we left behind you ancient doors. The King is coming in. The King is coming in. We lift up a shout to shake the sky. Lift up the cry, be glorified. The King is coming in. The King is coming in. We will dance, we will dance for 
river's flowing, church, and I don't want to, I don't want to get caught on a beach somewhere. I just want to stay right in the middle of that river, okay? Out of bellies will come rivers of living water. Sing it out, Suzanne.
Be refreshed. Be refreshed in the river of the Lord. Be refreshed. Drink from the well. You who are thirsty, drink from the well. kindness. We thank you, Lord, our Savior, our Deliverer, our King, and our God. We bless your name, a name that's above every name. And in that name, we are more than conquerors. Thank you, Jesus. No weapon formed against us can prosper. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. And every tongue that condemns, hallelujah, we condemn. This is our heritage as the children of God. And we thank you, Father, for you alone are worthy. And everybody said in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Give him a hand clap this morning. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Amen. Thank you, abbreviated worship team. Praise God. In the fullness of the Lord. Amen. It's only, it's only, it's only right. Praise the Lord. Now, I don't know what I'm going to do here because uh, I don't know if I should stay over here. Or go over here and preach to the people that are actually here. Praise the Lord. So, but God knows, amen, and he's got it all under control. Praise the Lord. Thank you all for being here this morning, and I appreciate those visiting, and uh, those of you that are somewhat regular. Praise the Lord. It's all good in Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. I try to keep an open mind about this, but... My brain keeps falling out, praise the Lord, so keep it focused. God is good, amen? So I want to I start with, this really isn't my text this morning, uh, but as usual, I'm a dysfunctional Christian, praise God. But I'm functioning perfect in Jesus, hallelujah. But I, I heard something the other day, and I want to share this with you. Uh, it it, it kind of sets up what I want to talk about. It isn't, you know, the pure... Uh, kind of text that you would normally use, but I just want to kind of bring this uh, to your attention and get us to focus on this as we move into uh, what I really feel like the Lord has given me to talk to you about this morning. But beginning here, I'd like to uh, start in Exodus, uh, Sheila, if you will, Exodus chapter 19, and we'll read verses 18 and 19 to start with here. Exodus 19, verses 18 and 19. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Everything's good in Jesus, right? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So uh, Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. 
Praise the Lord. All right, now let's go to chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. This is Mount Sinai. This is where God gives the law, right? Praise the Lord. It's where he, Moses encounters God. God. Moses goes up. God gives him the Ten Commandments on the tablets of stone, right? So God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not covet. And it just, you know, we know what they are, right? So we don't have to go through there. But that's what's happening here. This is God speaking from Mount Sinai to Moses. There is no temple. This is, there is no uh, place for the people to actually go and define their worship. It's all based on this law. God gives them the law. Then he goes on with Moses, we know, and he gives them the, the plan of the tabernacle and so on and so forth. But right now, they don't have any of that. What they've got is the law. All right? All right, go to, if you will, Sheila, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7. This is Mount Sinai that God is speaking from. What we just read. All right, Hebrews chapter 8, 7, and we'll read through 13. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. So the first covenant, we know, was the covenant of the law. Now this is in the book of Hebrews. Paul is taught, or there's a debate about who wrote the book of Hebrews. I happen to believe that it was Paul. But nevertheless, whoever wrote it is writing this to the Hebrews, to the Jews. All right? So if that first covenant had been faultless, then if, if the first covenant, if the Ten Commandments had been perfectly the way God wanted it, to save people, then it wouldn't have been, there wouldn't have been a second covenant. There wouldn't be a New Testament, right? Just be the old one. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the day comes, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant. And I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God. And they shall be my people. That's okay. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Somebody ought to say, praise the Lord, right there. Praise the Lord. In that he saith, a new covenant he hath made, the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Praise the Lord. So there's another covenant coming besides this one that's the Ten Commandments. It has come. Praise the Lord. Uh, at the time that Paul is speaking, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus has already taken place, and grace and mercy and truth have come Amen to the world. Hallelujah. Now, I want to show you the difference. How does this happen? How does this get into our hearts? How does it go from being an external law, a rule, a regulation, a to-do list, to something that's in us? Look at Numbers chapter 7, verse 89, which is the last uh, verse in that chapter. And then we're going to go into 8, 1, and 2, but starting right here in Numbers chapter 7, verse 89. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God's good, isn't he? Amen. Amen. No, 89. Verse 89. Numbers chapter 7. Last verse in that. Okay. And when Moses was gone into the tabernacle, now we've got a tabernacle. Now we've got a, uh, uh, an Ark of the Covenant, a mercy seat with the cherubim, you know. Uh, we've got the Holy of Holies, the holy place, the outer court. All of this is now there. So Moses was gone into the tabernacle of the congregation to speak with the Lord, and then he heard the voice of one speaking unto him from off the mercy seat, not Mount Sinai now, but from the mercy seat. In, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 5, it talks about Jesus being the mercy seat. In fact, uh, I preached a message about this some time ago. The elasterion is actually the Greek word, and it means mercy seat, place of propitiation, place of, uh, of forgiveness and mercy, so forth. So 
And here we know what's in the covenant, what's in that uh, ark that has the mercy seat on top of it, the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod, all of that stuff is in there, right? So Jesus is the thing that comes between us and judgment, between the law, which condemns, and you and I, is a mercy seat, the elasterium, the propitiation. Jesus is the mercy seat. So from the mercy seat, seat, God is speaking. Praise the Lord. And from the mercy seat, he talks altogether different than he did from Mount Sinai because there's something between the law and us. Jesus, God, amen. And so he, him, he heard the voice of one speaking unto him from off the mercy seat that was upon the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubim and he spake unto him, spoke to Moses, okay? Uh, verses 1 and 2. Chapter 8, I'm sorry. Chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. It'll just be a continuation here. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, again, here he is speaking from the mercy seat, speak unto Aaron and say unto him, when thou lightest the lamps, you know the, the menorah, you've got a candlestick in the middle, you've got three on either side, you've got seven candlesticks, but they're not candlesticks, it's beaten gold, it's all solid stuff, okay? So he says, speak unto Aaron and say unto him, when you light the lamps, the seven lamps shall give light over against the candlestick. Now if you see these, let me see if I can do it, it looks like a gang sign or something here, but anyhow, <laughs> what I'm saying is, in the middle, and then you've got three, right? And those lamps are lit so that they light towards the center candle. In other words, you can light them on the outside, you can light them on the inside. God tells him, light those things so they're pointing towards the center, towards the candlestick. Okay? Jesus is the candlestick. And what we're seeing clear back here is God saying, I'm going to put something in you. I'm going to put Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that's going to point everything to Jesus. Everything's going to be pointed to Jesus. Everything is going to light up Jesus. All right? Look at uh, Revelation chapter 1, and we'll read verses 12 through 17. My point in all of this is not to just be different here, but to get you to see that from the very beginning, the intent is that our eyes should be on Jesus. Not on all the problems, not on all the darkness, not on all the issues and and dysfunction and all the things that we all have and all experience because we're human beings and we live in a fallen world. But the focus has to be on Jesus and Jesus alone because he's the one that changes everything. Yes. Praise the Lord. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. This is John, amen, on the Isle of Patmos and he hears a voice and he turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks. He saw a menorah. And in the midst of the seven, in the middle of the menorah, Amen. Was one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girded about with the paps with a golden girdle. And his head and his hair were like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me and said, You horrible sinner! Fear not, I am the first and the last. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So my point in this preliminary is simply to get us to understand everything is about Jesus. Amen. Amen. Everything is about a focus on Jesus. The only way we're ever going to experience deliverance is by looking to Jesus, not looking to the problem, not looking to our own abilities, our own strength, our own perfection or lack thereof, but looking to Christ. That's the theme of the Bible. That's the whole story that we have from Genesis through Revelation. It's all Jesus. It's all just a story of us and Jesus. Praise the Lord. And we, so many times we miss that by being religious. Hallelujah. And so that's what I want to tell. Let's go to John chapter 4, verse 14. Hallelujah. I actually freak out sometimes when I have Suzanne or Roberto or Mike or whoever it is up here talking and they're just reading... You know, my message, praise the Lord. God's good. Amen. He likes to give us confirmations, hallelujah, because we don't have a whole lot of confidence in ourselves, but man, we can have confidence in the Lord. Praise God. 
So whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Somebody say praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. So uh, a few, I don't think it was a couple, three months ago or whatever. You know, I used to work in restaurants years ago when I first got out of the search and attended bar and things like that. So I know a little bit about cooking and I don't do a lot of it unless my wife is sick and sometimes she pretends to be sick to most of the time, it's a phone call takes care of that, praise the Lord. Chicken in flight or, you know, whatever. But I'm saying, I, 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 I usually get up early, and, and I'm early, up earlier than Sally. Not that she sleeps all day, but I'm saying I get up early. Because I just wake up, and so I get up. And I'm making orange juice because she forgot to make it the night before. So it's on her, basically. But anyway, I'm making orange juice. I don't make orange juice very often, but I thought I remembered how to make it. I mean, this is not a difficult thing. you got a can, right? It's like this. you got orange juice, and you put it in a pitcher and add water. Problem is, instead of adding the three that you're supposed to add, I added four. I thought I knew what the directions were. I thought I understood the instructions, you know, so I just didn't read the directions. I thought, come on, it's orange juice. How difficult can this be? You know, I can just do it. It's like soup, you know? Campbell soup or something. And the more I think about this, you know, I thought I knew the correct amount, but I didn't. I screwed up. So I had too much water in it. And the more I thought about this, that ruined orange juice, because it's not fit to drink when it's diluted. But you drink it, it's just nasty, praise the Lord. But it's a way of understanding the concept of watering down the message of Jesus. It's anything that we do that distorts or obscures or hinders other people from the true message of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now, the, there's one way of looking at it is that it was my failure of, uh, in making the orange juice was that I added too much water. Or, on the other hand, you could say, I didn't add enough orange juice. Right? Praise the Lord. Either way, the end result is the final product didn't look like the label on the can. It looked like kind of bad water instead of this beautiful, really tasty orange juice, praise the Lord. I'm saying that the solution to bad theology is always good theology, praise the Lord. The solution to water down Jesus is to rediscover the undiluted Jesus and this radical message that too often gets lost in religion. Praise the Lord. To be successful, we have to be willing to set aside whatever religion has told us and be willing to rediscover something that once upon a time was undiluted. Hallelujah. Amen. If you do, you'll find peace. If you do, you'll find life. Hallelujah. Peace that passes understanding. Life more abundant. Praise God. That's what God is interested in. He's not interested in our religion. He's interested in us. He's interested in a relationship, amen, with us. Praise God. All right, John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40, Sheila. John 5, 39 and 40. Sheila's threatening to charge me for a trip to the nail place because I just wear hers out because I'm trying to find scriptures back there. Just keep trying <laughs> yeah, it ain't going to happen, but keep trying. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that you might have life. Praise the Lord. So diluted faith, watered down with loyalty to tradition, loyalty to a movement, amen, loyalty to a lot of things other than Jesus. The true flavor gets masked by too many theological traditions. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 4, verses 19 through 22. Matthew 4, 19 through 22. Jesus came with a very simple message. I'm the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. I am the perfect representation of God. You won't ever find any other God but Jesus. And he is the perfect representation of the invisible God. 
He's not an add-on. He's not a kinder version. He is the same. The one and the same. Amen? And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 8, verse 22. Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury the dead. Praise the Lord. We need to live by a faith that is totally and completely centered on Jesus and nothing else. Even if that means dumping some long-held belief systems or adding ones that have been left out. That's the only responsibility that we really have. Jesus doesn't invite us to a rigid religion a tiresome tradition, or loyalty to a black and white set of doctrines. It's not in the scripture. He doesn't do that. The New Testament, Jesus chooses disciples that we're seeing right here, and when he went about that, he, you don't see him passing a long statement of faith, or a church constitution, or bylaws. Just an invitation to put down whatever weight, whatever thing that they're carrying, amen, just the invitation to Relax and follow me. Put down the burdens. Oh, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, come unto me. I'll give you rest. How many of you have come to Jesus but didn't find a lot of rest? Because something between us and Jesus is always putting another burden on us. Religion is always adding one more stick to the pile. Amen? It's always saying that's good, but this will be even better. But Jesus doesn't. That's what we've done. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus warned he was the real source of life. And rejecting him in favor of anything, including religion, is to choose what will spiritually dehydrate you instead of what can breathe life into dry bones. We talked about last week. Amen. Hallelujah. It, it, we got to have something that brings life, not something that adds to the the, the sense of death and separation from God. Praise the Lord. John chapter 5, verse 39 and 40. Again, is it still up there? No, we jumped from that one. Go back to that if you would, Sheila. John uh, 5, 39 and 40. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me, and you won't come to me that you might have life. I mean, the entire Bible, I said this at the very beginning when we looked at those scriptures back way back in the Old Testament of God speaking to us. Amen. The entire Bible is designed to point us to Jesus. It's designed to direct our lives back to Jesus and only Jesus, not to Jesus and some other stuff. Amen. Not a watered down Jesus, but back to the original real Jesus. Hallelujah. What Jesus was doing, what Jesus was and what he meant. Praise the Lord. The original radical message was actually pretty simple. It was an invitation to walk away from religious burdens and old understandings of God in exchange for following the one who claimed to be the undiluted way. Praise the Lord, the undiluted truth and the undiluted life. And we look at the Jews and we say, my God, what was wrong with them that they couldn't see this? Well, I'll tell you why. They were given the law by God, but the law in itself wasn't even enough for them. They had to add some other stuff. And they kept adding, and they kept adding, and they kept adding until God actually shows up, and they don't even recognize him. And he's not doing anything different from what he said that he was going to do from the very beginning. But because their minds had been so distorted by this false image of God and the false representations of God that they couldn't even see God when he showed up, and that's what Jesus is talking about here. Here I am, but you won't come to me. Why? Because there's something between you and me. And it's called religion. Praise the Lord. If we want to be people who live an authentic Christianity, the faith of Christ, one that isn't diluted, one that isn't tasteless, 
then we need to be a people who are willing to radically reorient our lives on the invitation to drop what we're carrying and just follow him. Praise the Lord. Drop the dogma. Drop the traditions. Drop the theological, denominational add-ons. Drop the personality cults. Oh, I got to get to where brother so-and-so is. I got to get this person to pray for me. I got to have this person prophesy over me. I got to have this special one lay hands on me. It's, it's not scriptural. We're to lay hands on them. Praise the Lord. It's okay that we lay hands on one another because sometimes we're down. We're, we're, our faith isn't where it needs to be. But initially, what Jesus is talking about is laying hands on the unbeliever. Show them a miracle. We don't, we're not supposed to have to have a miracle. We've got the miracle. We've got Christ in us, the hope of glory. Our faith is to be based on him, not on stuff that's happening around us. Praise the Lord. We don't need a miracle to believe in God. We've already had our miracle. We've been born again. Praise the Lord. We've been born from above. We have a God living with us and in us and through us. Praise the Lord. It's the unbeliever that needs signs, wonders, and miracles. I'm all for them. I love it whenever they happen, but I'm not waiting, holding my breath to love God or to accept God's love for me, waiting for a miracle to happen for me to believe it. Praise the Lord. We've seen people healed. We've seen people. I've seen persons raised from the dead. But I've seen a bunch of people die that didn't get raised from the dead. But it doesn't change the truth of God. It's the will of God that none perish but all come to repentance. It's not the will of God for people to be sick. It's not the will of God for people to be impoverished. If it was, Jesus wouldn't have come and made himself poor that we might become rich. He wouldn't have suffered those stripes so that we could be healed. The fact is, we are healed. We were healed. Amen? By his stripes, you were healed. It's a finished work. What he did on the cross, he said, it is finished. That means it's finished. It's done. Now it's just a question of us receiving it, believing, focusing on him. Amen? John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. And don't misunderstand me. I'm not against... I'm not jealous. I'm not against big name preachers and, and you know, the, the notoriety and the, and the attention they get. But, it, hey, I, I, I've told you this many times. I went through all this stuff. I went everywhere. I went here. I went there to get this person to impart, this person to lay hands, this person to pray over you. And the last time, God just, I think God was just fed up with me. And he said, what are you going to get from that man that you don't already have? There's only one anointing. It's the anointed one, Jesus you are as anointed as any believer or any preacher or anybody else. If you're not, you're not saved. Because if you're born again, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily, and you are complete in him. You have the same Godhead dwelling in you. It's called Jesus, praise the Lord, the hope of glory. How silly of us to run to, you know, Tucson or, or, or Arkansas or Minneapolis or someplace to get some guy to pray for me or to prophesy over me. I can do it. Paul said, I would that you all prophesy. You all have the same ability. You lay hands on the sick. Praise the Lord. We have diminished the body of Christ to a handful of individuals when God said that his glory would fill the earth as the water covers the sea. And that these signs would follow them that believed, not them that had the biggest church or that had the greatest ministry or that had the biggest name. Hey, I, I said, I, look, I, I don't care what other people do. And I enjoy it. I watch, you know, Christian TV and some of it because a lot of it is just as bogus as the day is long. But, hey, that's their business. They have a right to be wrong. <laughs> but I'm just saying, we wear ourselves out and we... we minimize Jesus and what he's done in our lives when we're always looking for something to happen 
amen, something's going to happen, somebody's going to show up and do this, or somebody, or we're going to go somewhere and get this, and then all the time, we're missing what we already have. We're missing not only the awareness of this Christ in us, but the ability then to transfer this Christ in us to the unbeliever so that they can be healed, so that they can be delivered, so that they can change their mind about Jesus. That's what repentance is. Repentance isn't how bad I feel about the dumb stuff that I've done or do. Repentance is changing my mind. It's, it's not seeing God the way I've always seen him, but now I see him as Jesus. Now I see this Jesus, this great, loving, merciful, graceful God. That's my God. That's repentance. That is revelation. You're repenting right now. If you're hearing something you hadn't heard before, if it's changing your mind, if you're beginning to see Jesus in a little bit different light, that's repentance. We have repentance every time we come together. Praise the Lord. Because God is becoming more real. A better, more loving, more generous, more forgiving. I ran into an old friend of mine at my, uh, I think it was at my mother's funeral. And uh, we'd, you know, we'd gone to school together and uh, all through school. And he came up to me and he said, and they were very religious when they were kids, and I wasn't. We went to Sunday school, but we were far from religious. We went because it was, back in those days, it was just the socially correct thing to do. Everybody went to church, whether they believed God or believed in God or not. You just went because you couldn't live in a little community like that and, and be a atheist or heathen, you know, not without a lot of problems. So anyway, he came up to me and he said, you know, it's weird how our lives have changed. It's like they flip-flopped. You know, I was the churchgoer, the, he's talking about himself, the believer and all this, and, and you were, well, I didn't know what he wanted to say, but he didn't, he was kind, and just said you were different than that. <laughs> but I told him, I said, Stan, you know something? What I found out was God wasn't near as mean or as angry as I thought he was when I was a kid. I found out he really did love me, that he really was on my side. He wasn't against me. And it changed everything. I didn't feel like I had to run from him anymore. I didn't feel like I had to be a hypocrite and pretend to be something that I wasn't. He knew me. He knew the worst of me. And yet he still gave his life for me. He did it when I had no desire for him, while I was yet a sinner. I was alienated from God, separated from God, and God came to me and loved me in all of my mess. And he didn't say, now you've got six months to get your act together or I'm cutting you off. No. He said, no man will ever take you out of my hand. Not even you in your ignorance, in your rebellious attitude, in your sinful behavior. Because every one of your sins have been paid for past, present, and future. Jesus became your sin, and you have become Jesus. I know that makes everybody nervous. I'm not God, but I am not the firstborn, but one of them after the firstborn. He was the firstborn of many brethren, and he's not ashamed to call us family. In God's eyes, I'm just like Jesus, because God's eyes saw Jesus like me when he was crucified. You say, well, that's fine up to the point that I accepted Christ, but what about the sins that I committed afterwards? Every single sin in your life was after the cross. Praise the Lord. And do you think that God, with his foreknowledge, didn't know you were going to be committing some sin after you got born again? Because Jesus gives us this paradigm that, uh, you know, sin is not what you do. Sin is something in the heart. So you say, well, I've never committed adultery. Why? Because nobody would commit adultery with you? <laughs> yeah, because you were afraid to get caught? I'm not endorsing adultery. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying, what I'm saying is, if you look on a woman and you have a thought, you're guilty. If you say to somebody, I hate your guts, you know, you don't kill them because you don't want to go to jail forever. But you'd like to, if there wasn't consequences, 
You hate them. And he says, to hate somebody is the same as murder. In the eyes of God, thinking the thing is as bad as doing the thing. Now, who of us cannot think about some of those things? You can discipline yourself. You can order your life to where you don't do all those things, but you can't stop the thoughts from coming. So we're still sinners, helpless, without the grace of God. By the grace of God, he's put something in my heart. It's Jesus who now represents me before the throne of God. And every time the enemy points his finger to condemn me, he said, with my own lips, I will condemn the condemner. How do I do that? Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you for making me the righteousness of God in Christ. Think about that for a minute. The righteousness of God is what he declares you to be. Now, how many of us feel uncomfortable with that title? I mean, knowing ourselves as we know ourselves. And yet God says, that's who you are. That's your identity from me. I put my reality on you. You are the beloved. You are the perfected. You say, oh my God, I must not be saved because I know I'm not perfected. That's because we're looking at something other than Jesus. We're looking at us instead of him. He is our elasterion. He is our propitiation. He is our mercy seat. He is the thing that comes between the judgment of God and us. The requirements of the law, amen, and us. He did it perfect. Praise the Lord. John 8, uh, 1 through 11. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman that was taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery, in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that he might, that they might have, a, have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger he wrote in the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself, and he said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it began, being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, and even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, a woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man con condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. All right? Go to 1 Timothy Chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. 1 Timothy 1, uh, 15 and 16. This is a faithful saying, Paul is speaking, and he says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Remember, he was a murderer. He was a, a blasphemer in terms of the truth about God and the Holy Spirit and so forth. And he said, but how be it for this cause... I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So Paul is saying, I'm like the example here. I'm, I was the worst sinner you can imagine. I sinned against God. I sinned against the Holy Spirit. I sinned against the church. And so God is using me for this cause. I obtain mercy. What cause? That in me, first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Long suffering. Jesus has declared you righteous. Paul is our example. See, justice that seen through the eyes of the scriptures is less focused on punishing wrongdoing 
and more concerned with restoration. It's designed to bring peace and restoring wholeness to people. Praise God. Let's go to Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee? I think that's pretty big there, what the Lord requires of you. What is it? Just to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Praise the Lord. When we start pouring out some of the religious waters that have diluted our concept of what it means to follow Jesus, we find that Jesus offers us something better. Praise the Lord. Something timeless and a way of living that is outside of any label. This alternative way of living was what Jesus called the kingdom. Praise the Lord. Kingdom living is a doorway to a radical new life. In fact, Jesus called living in the kingdom life eternal or God life. The kingdom is so radical so upside down, so backward to anything else that we've ever experienced, during the ministry of Jesus, he warned all of these religious leaders, these scribes and the Pharisees and so on and so forth, that the tax collectors and the prostitutes were going to enter the kingdom ahead of them. That ought to give us some pause to see how radical this Christianity is. We've, we've made it very mundane, and, and, and when we think it's all, you know, wild and crazy, but it's, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit the radicalness and, the, and the, the outrageous ways that Jesus dealt with people. It's unbelievable. It's not a do this and I'll do this. It's a I've done everything, just thank you, Jesus, and receive it. Praise God. You know what we haven't realized is that it's possible to be a Christian but not enter this new way of living called the kingdom. Praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah. I've been saved a long time. And I'm still not real sure when I'm in the kingdom and when I'm not. You know what I'm saying? Because there's still just too much of me most of the time. But I lived a good number of years born again without understanding anything about the kingdom. Praise God. That's exactly what was happening during the time that Jesus was here on earth. He came to preach the kingdom of God. It's near you. It's coming. Get ready for it. Repent. Change your mind about how you think about God. Because this kingdom thing is going to be God life operating through you. So the religious were content with religion. And when they were invited into this radical new way of living, they chose to reject life in the kingdom in favor of rigorous religious exercise. You can think what you want to about it, but it's, it's there. It's, it's, it's the argument that they had against Jesus. It's too easy, too simple. Too much Jesus and not enough me. What am I supposed to do? If thou canst believe. Praise the Lord. The religious were content with religion. And when they were invited into a radical new way of living, they said, no thanks. Entering the kingdom means that first we have to leave the kingdom we've been in. Praise the Lord. 
we hear those scriptures, come out from among them and be ye separate. And we think they're talking about the drug addicts, the drunks, the messed up. No. He's talking about religion. Praise the Lord. Entering the kingdom means that first we have to leave an old one. No matter how good, no matter how comfortable the previous one might be. That's why Jesus said, leave your stuff and just follow me. Put the focus me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. All of us struggle with this. Everybody, every one of us, I promise you. And we go through things, and the first thought, now, now I'm speaking for me, but if the shoe fits, you know, you can slip it on or whatever. But When something bad is happening in your life, something that you can't seem to get delivered from or, you know, overcome it or get the end result satisfied and settled, whatever it might be, Usually the first thought that comes is, what have I done? What haven't I done? What did I do to incur the wrath of God or the anger of God or these things to fall on me? Or what haven't I done to please God enough so that he would just bless me? That's the lie of the devil. God is all through with the judgment business until this earth ends, until the church is raptured. Then he will deal with the unbelief. Now, I don't know all the theology there. Some may be saved after that and so on and so forth. I'd like to believe that that's the case. But nevertheless, the judgment that falls on this world is not God judging them. It's the result of them not turning to Christ. Otherwise, God's lying and saying that it's not his will that any should perish. There will be some perish. I'm not saying that this is just a you know, pass, hall pass for everybody who's going to heaven. No, people will go to hell. But the reason they're going to hell isn't because of their bad behavior. The reason they're going to hell is because they refuse to receive the gift of grace from God that Jesus already paid for their bad behavior. And when we try to make it about our doing good, we diminish what Jesus really did. And we make other people look at us instead of looking at Jesus. We make them think that, hey, if I can be good like he is, then I can go to heaven. Oh, well, friend, you don't know me, first of all. You probably ought to talk to my wife before you make that judgment because I cannot be the best person in the world. I can fail. I can get angry. I can do stupid stuff. I can sin. I just can't be judged for it. So the motive of my living for God is not fear of judgment or wrath or, or condemnation. My reason for wanting to love God and serve God is because he first loved me. Because he loved me in all of my brokenness, in all of my sickness, in all of my weakness. Even to this day, he still loves me and gave himself for me. And why would I then believe that he would not give me all things? If he would give his son, if he would give his own life. then why wouldn't I believe that he would give me all things? Praise the Lord. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So for us today, we find ourselves in the middle of a story. The story that's been unfolding you know, since before the foundation of the world. The diluted version of the story goes like this. You were a horrible, totally depraved sinner. And our sins earned us the ways of death. The wages of death. Sin, right? Or death is the wages of sin. Amen? So our sin gives us this, this what we've earned, which is, in the end, hell forever. 
cut off from God, tormented forever. Amen? But Jesus came and lived a sinless life. He received the wrath of God and was punished in our place on the cross. Because Jesus paid our debt, you and I can be legally set free and experience eternity with everybody else who has put their faith in Christ. That is the diluted gospel. It's not incorrect. It's just diluted. Watered down into something that is infinitely less than what the big picture reveals. The radical message of Jesus is that you and I are part of a bigger story and have a bigger role to play than we've ever realized. And partly because of religion, because we believe that it's only the guy up here that does that stuff. It's only the traveling evangelist. It's only the, the unique individual that maybe has some special skill set, you know, when it comes to the spirit realm, and they can do stuff. Praise the Lord. We've diluted it down to where we have actually done what the Scripture accused the, the Jews of, having limited God by their traditions. Because God's only going to move when you move. He's only going to do what you will do. God doesn't just come through the room and find, okay, there's a sick person, there's a sick person, there's a sick person. Now, he can move in an atmosphere where we have faith for that. But typically what we're doing is we're saying God won't do it unless brother so-and-so shows up, Dr. Fahrenheit, or so-and-so somebody else comes in, or, so, or the special person lays a hand on me. You're not ministering, and you can't get ministered to when you have all the healing that there is inside of you. You have the prosperity. You have the, the breakthrough. You have the ability to prophesy. The radical message of Jesus is that you and I have a huge part to play in this. The undiluted version is that Jesus is victorious over the works of the devil. And Jesus has begun a process of reconciling everything. We've all been given an invitation. An invitation to partner with God in reconciling everything he made. In other words, to take our authority in the earth. Isn't that what Jesus said when he left? These signs will follow them that believe. He didn't say these signs will follow them that have, you know, a, a license for ministry. He didn't say these signs will follow those that, you know, go to seminary or that pastor a church or that evangelize or that have some specific ministry. He said these signs follow believers. Why? How can, how can that be? Because he's in the believer. That reality is in the believer. We're to be a people who who exist to bless other people, who remove barriers to them encountering God, not build barriers to keep them from getting to God, to be a people who pronounce not condemnation, but reconciliation. God didn't say we were called, we were condemned so that we could go out and condemn everybody else. He said we were reconciled so we could be reconcilers. So we can get people to the real God, to the real Jesus, the true Jesus. Yeah. Not our limited vision, religiously uh, accepted vision, but the real Jesus, the real God. Yeah. Romans 8, uh, 19 through 21. Praise the Lord. Stay with me. We won't be long here. Hallelujah. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption unto the glorious liberty of the children of God. So God's story begins and ends with creation. Perfect creation, a creation in a perfect state of peace and harmony. That's the way it starts, that's the way it ends. Praise the Lord. Like us, creation 
hasn't experienced the fullness of that reconciliation. Praise the Lord. But we, you and I, are invited to participate in it right now. Not after we're dead and in heaven, but now. And in fact, the only way the creation begins to experience this is when the creature does. When those of us that are born again and begin to walk out this kingdom life, nothing changes. You can have all the green peace, you can have all the tree huggers and, uh, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm not against, you know, being conservative and stuff when it comes to, you know, the, the, the planet, but come on, God created this. He didn't have a problem creating it. It's no different than our bodies. We are healed. This earth is a new creation. It just hasn't experienced the fullness of it yet. Praise the Lord. Like us, this creation hasn't experienced it, but we are invited to participate in it right now. How? By faith. That's why the just live by faith. Praise God. You and I were born to be people who reconcile things, people, things, stuff. That's what we were born again for. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. So the invitation of Jesus is an invitation to embrace a new identity. Praise the Lord. One that looks radically different than any identity we've ever experienced. That's the invitation. That's what Jesus is calling us to. Jesus has been offering this identity for a long time. But we've missed it with all the ways that we intentionally and unintentionally put faith in other things. We either intentionally or unintentionally dilute the faith that's named after him. We make it about everything but him. We make it all about us. We make it all about our list of do's and don'ts. If the religious elite condemn us, but the social outcasts want to come over for dinner to talk about God, we've arrived at something way more in line with the undiluted version of Jesus. And you say, well, that's, that can't be. Well, then explain to me why that was Jesus' daily reality when he was here. And are we not to be following him? Acts chapter 3, uh, 7 through 16. Acts chapter 3, 7 through 16, excuse me. God didn't call us to be religious. He called us to be new creatures. New creations. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength, and he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement that that which had happened unto him. And the lame man which was healed held Peter and John. All the people ran together unto him, porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob and the God of our fathers hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the prince of life whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom you see and now Yea, the faith is, which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And the faith which is by him is not the faith in the man, but the faith of Jesus. Praise the Lord. 
Acts 16, verses 16 through 18. See, we, we don't see a whole lot of this because if somebody gets healed, if, you know, we, we don't stop the parade of people coming to us for healing. We just keep the prayer line going instead of pointing them to Jesus. Instead of, why are you coming to me? Why don't you just look to Jesus? We say, bring them on. I'll get a bigger van. I'll get bigger meetings. I'm not saying everybody thinks that way. I'm just saying the natural result of human beings is if you give them power, they will take it. You yield your life's authority to somebody else, and eventually they're going to take advantage of it. It's what we do. It's what people do. Someone much wiser than me said it. Power corrupts. Absolute power absolutely corrupts. Corrupts everything. Give people power, and you're looking for corruption. It'll happen because people are not God. They just have God. We have to depend on his grace to live this life. My spirit's perfect. Your spirit is perfect. It's righteous. It's holy. It's exactly like Jesus. It's not going to change. It's, not gonna, it's as good as it's ever going to get. So you don't need grace for your spirit. You need grace for this thing that doesn't want to cooperate with the Spirit, that wants its own way, that is still selfish, except to the degree that we get our mind renewed to the Word of God. And if we're going to renew our mind to the Word of God, we need to know what it is God's actually saying, not interpreted through our own belief systems. Came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show us unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the, to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Go back to 17 if you can, Sheila. Verse 17. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. What is wrong with that? Paul said, She's got a demon. Cast the demon out. And all she's doing is going around saying, These people are of God. These are the men of God. Amen. They, they, these are the servants of the Most High God. They're showing us the way to salvation. She did it for days. And instead of Paul saying, Thank you very much for the free advertising. Thank you for drawing a crowd. He said, she's got a devil. Come out of her. Why? Because the attention was all about Paul and not Jesus. And Paul recognized it. This is not coming from God. This is not somebody doing something for God. This is somebody working, being manipulated by the devil. Why? Because he's pointing to us and not to God. Because he's talking about us. Because he's making us the big scene. Why? Because Paul knew, as you and I both know, in our own lives, he was flawed. We like to look at him and say, this is, he, hey, he wasn't Jesus. He was Paul, saved by Jesus. And they got issues. They still got issues in the, in the men, between themselves. They're arguing and fussing over all kinds of stuff. People are saying, I'm of Paul. I'm of Cephas. And Paul says, shut up about that stuff. You're either of Jesus or you're not at all. Right. Praise the Lord. When we've got our lives oriented on religious identity, instead of Jesus alone, there's a huge, huge obstacle in our path to relationships. The main focus of Jesus' life was showing us how to know and to experience God. That's what he was here for. That's what he was interested in. Not to create religion, not to create all the do's and the don'ts, but to get us into an experience with God. To see, I am God in the flesh. I'm a good God. I love you. I've given my life for you. 
Not based on what you can do for me, because you're not doing anything for me. I'm doing it for you. And I want you to know this is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of our forefathers. The God of creation. The only true and living God. And this is what he's really like. He's a God of mercy. A God of love. A God of compassion. God who sacrifices everything to have relationship with us and ask nothing of us except to open our arms and receive it. He did it. He showed the people how to experience God and he did it by constantly tearing down the obstacles that prevented people from having a safe place to encounter the living God. Sadly, a lot of our churches are not that safe. And when we encounter what we believe to be God, it's anger, it's judgment, it's condemnation. When God never came to bring condemnation, he came to give us restoration and reconciliation. It's simple. It's radical, but it's simple. Remember, Jesus was a guy that said a lot of things that made people uncomfortable. I guess we're in good company. Praise the Lord. Before his radical message can change others, it's got to change us. After all these years, Jesus is still offering us something different, something life-giving, something that results in freedom, not bondage something that quenches your thirst, something that fills the hungry places in our lives, something that opens our eyes to God, something that heals our wounds, something undiluted. Jesus offers us All he says us is just receive it. Lay down whatever you're carrying, whatever weight. Just lay it down and follow me. Keep the focus on me. Because I'll never leave you or forsake you. David said it like this. Once I was young, now I'm old. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread. And we are the righteousness of God in Christ. We have a promise. He won't forsake us. There'll always be grain in the barn, grain in the field. We can be the head, not the tail, above and not beneath. Amen? Amen. The lender and not the borrower. But we do it by staying focused on Jesus and the goodness of God. He is our great reward. He is our shield and exceeding great reward. Give him a hand clap this morning, will you? (laughs) Praise God. Amen, amen, amen. It's a good God. Hallelujah. Let me pray for you, and then I'll dismiss you in Jesus' name. Father, I just thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your just, the amazing grace that you share with us every moment of every day. Thank you, Lord for suffering the judgment that I deserved. And thank you, Lord, for giving me the reward that you alone deserved. Thank you for loving me, even in my unlovableness. And thank you, God, for making it possible for me then to love others as you have loved me. Thank you for reconciliation and the ability to reconcile others. Thank you for everything and all things all exist and consist by you and for you. We bless your name, the name that's above every name. And in that name, we declare victory over every lie of the enemy, over every attack of the enemy. But we are more than victorious, more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. 
Thank you, Father. Bless your people. Go with them. Give them revelation. Open their understanding. And give them peace that passes all understanding. And let them experience the fullness of your love, your goodness, and your grace. And we ask it all in the name that's above every name, the name to which we bow today and confess as our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in that precious name. Hallelujah. Have a great week. Live it. Amen. Like you know how. Praise God.